Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, welcome to what's going to be, I believe, an outstanding panel on a very timely subject. Unfortunately, it's a problem that plagues about one in three students in our country this year. And oh, by the way, if you did the math on that, we're talking about 18 million young people. And the subject is bullying. Um, I'm going to be extremely brief on our panel, but just so you know, they've agreed to take questions after their presentation. So we've got some microphones in the audience, and we'll have some rovers to, to, to take your questions to this expert panel that we have today. Uh, first and foremost, we'll be the executive director of the National School Boards Association and CEP board member, Dr. Ann Bryant. Following her remarks will be uh, Professor Emeritus Jason Oler, who, among other things, has written a book called Digital Community, Digital Citizen. And then finally, rounding it out, will be CEP board member, an author of 23 books, uh, Dr. Michelle Borba, who, oh, by the way, was the author of a bill that was uh, dealt with ending school violence and student bullying that was approved in California. And that was some time ago before it was kind of a hot button item. So on that note, I turn it over to you, Dr. Bryant, to start things off. OK. Thank you, Joe. Mm -hmm. Well, good morning. Good morning. Um, I'm very honored to be here, and I'm really glad that I'm here with Michelle and Jason, because they are the experts. I am not. Uh, but I'm not a passive bystander. And so what I'm going to share with you this morning are some facts that you know well, and then a project that the National School Boards Association uh, kicked off this summer um, that you might find useful. So first of all, I want to ask you, how many of you, raise your hand, are aware that you have bullying in your school? Wow. Um, how many of you have done student climate surveys in your school? Uh, a little fewer. And how many of you have um, active anti-bullying programs in your school? How many of you have witnessed bullying or been a victim yourself of bullying? So the rest of you haven't clearly been to the floor of the US Congress. <laughs> I had to add a little humor. Um, those of us in Washington get very frustrated by our leaders. Um, the National School Boards Association has had a multi-year commitment to school climate, to bullying prevention, and to school health. And for the last several years, we have, in fact, from 2007, 8, and 9, we've done a number of surveys through our Council of Urban Boards of Education on school climate. And I'm going to share with you just a little of that data. Um, the quote that I love, because it's part of the framework of the key work of school boards, is on the screen. Students cannot learn in chaos, fear, or embarrassment. If you really want to know what people feel about their schools, ask them. So you'll find that a lot of my uh, comments are going to be about students themselves. So here's the data from those Council of Urban Board of Education surveys. Half of all students witness children being bullied at least once a month. One third of students aged 12 to 18 report being bullied. This was 30,000 students across the country in urban school districts in 2007, followed by 10,000 teachers and administrators, followed by a survey of parents. So we asked students, um, and we got the answers. Bullied middle schoolers can see their GPA decline as much as 1.5%, and students who are harassed by their peers are less likely to feel connected to school. And that's where the whole character education piece comes in. Because wouldn't it be true that if we really had infused character education in every school, that we wouldn't see bullying occurring? Because students often are the best answers to the issue of bullying. So the issue is also clearly one where lesbian, gay, transgender, and bisexual students feel the brunt of it the most. And these figures are compelling. 30% um, miss schools because they didn't feel safe um, as compared to 6.7% of regular students. And the student data among our CUBE surveys show that black and Hispanic students view their school climate quite differently from white students. So I want to tell you, um, I love this quote. This is our president, Mary Broderick. And this is on the students on board um, toolkit that we've created. Uh, because we decided um, about a year ago that talking to students, school board members talking to students, would be a good thing. So how did this crazy idea come up? Well, 
Um, one of the reasons is because we have been tracing school districts that have really been making a difference uh, for now um, a number of years. And how, is anyone here from Sullivan County, Tennessee? Well, this is an amazing district. Um, they had actually a court order because of an incident, uh, racially provoked incident of bullying. And so there was a court order uh, for them to change the way they operated. So they did student surveys, and they were shocked to find out that white students in Sullivan County, Tennessee, thought the school climate was just fine. Thank you very much. But black and Hispanic students did not. And so they created something that's called Respect and Leadership Initiative Teams, where students, faculty, and the principal of the high school would get together, and they, in fact, initiated and carried out the surveys, the leadership teams, and they purposefully picked on those leadership teams students who were the negative leaders. In other words, they didn't do just representatives of kids they thought would be well-behaved. They picked some of the bully leaders to be on this leadership team. To the extent that one of the students said, I can't believe they picked me. I can't believe. I'm, I was lead bully. But that's what helped turn it around. So not only did it, in fact, turn it around, but the achievement data went up dramatically. And that Tennessee school district is now in very different shape than it was just a little over a year ago. So what did NSBA do? Well, I went to the um, US Department of Education first summit on bullying in August of 2010. And it was a very interesting meeting. Nine different departments put that summit together. Many of you may have been there. Uh, and I was struck by, over two days, I heard more smart things from students than I did from the collective adults. In fact, Joe Mazzola and I were both in the room, and that made it really easy to have students be smarter than the collective adults. Uh, but I was struck by how these 10 students who attended this conference basically said, we can stop this. We can stop this. So fast forward, conversation with Kevin Jennings. Many of you know Kevin. He was the former head at the Department of the Safe and Drug, C Safe and Drug Free Schools uh, Initiative. So we were sitting around, and we came up with this idea of a couple of school board members initiating a conversation with students in middle schools and high schools, selected by the superintendent or the principal. So it's a very simple toolkit. And it basically poses questions like you see before you. I don't need to read them. And one of the things that has really struck us is as we launched this this August, this August 2011 across the country, are some of the stories that have been coming forward. Um, stories of, gee, we don't usually talk to students. Now, these are school board members who are about the business of running a school district. And so they have monthly meetings. Sometimes they have committee meetings. They're busy people. They focus on student achievement, many of them. But talking to students other than congratulating them for an award they've received or congratulating the football team or the, the play that they go to, just having a conversation often doesn't happen. So that's the premise behind this very simple program. Um, the key question for boards to ask students, if you were the school board, what would be the one thing you could do to improve schools? And I want to read you just very briefly as I end um, the story that got uh, produced in the Alabama, actually, Mobile uh, newspaper about one of these conversations. Quinterios Toppings said he'd use the extra land at his Blunt High School to build a career technical center to teach student trades. His classmate, Chantevier Daly, said she'd encourage all students, not just those in advanced classes, to succeed. We need to take the regular classes out, she said. When you put in the head that they can't do more than regular, then they have it in their head that they can't do more than regular. 16 students from 11 Mobile County's 13 high schools had nearly an hour and a half conversation with the school board Thursday at the system's central office. It was part of an initiative by the National School Boards Association to share ideas called Students on Board. Mobile County School Board President Ken Megatson said he hopes to do it again soon. I'm proud of how open and honest the students were. It was a pleasure for us as a board and superintendent to sit and listen to what they had to say. The students talked about how some of their classmates take school seriously, while others don't. They said some students don't like each other because they come from different neighborhoods. 
They talked about the fact that some schools offer better classes, extracurricular activities, and facilities, and others don't have those same facilities. They talked about the pride they have in their schools. They talked about what they like and don't like about their teachers. And they talked a little about football. This is Alabama and some of the results over the recent scores. It's good to have the opinions of students floating around in the air, said student Denzel Lampley. Maybe we can lend our voices and make some change. So I think the gist of what I have to say, and now we're going to turn it over to the real experts, is students can be the force for change. So thank you. OK, am I on here? Waiting for my slides to come up. By the way, um, I wasn't texting my wife. I was actually reconstructing the notes that I'd made at my, <clears throat> excuse me, my table there and had conveniently or inconveniently left at my table. And I think I've got them here. OK. Um, I'm going to zoom out. And my perspective is that character education is exactly what cyberspace needs. And yet you don't see it there. What you see there, basically, is we're playing whack-a-mole. Every new issue that comes up, we take the mallet, whack, it'll go down, that'll be it. We'll, we'll fix that and everything will be fine. And then along comes sexting and whack, we'll get rid of that and that'll be fine. And then ID theft, and you know what? We're just getting warmed up. You should see the technology that's coming down the pike. And if we think we can sort of take each individual issue and deal with them discreetly without doing something foundational, we're just plain wrong. The bottom line is technology and innovation is never going to take a week off. It goes and goes and goes and goes. I have an iGoogle newspaper, e-newspaper. How many people have one of those? If you really want to scare yourself, create one of these. You go out and you get all the feeds from all the websites you really like. For me, it's all about technological change and sort of anthropology and change and education and change. And so once a day, I go to my e-newspaper and I sort of go like this as I turn it on because I'm about to get sprayed by a fire hose of all the stuff that got made just today. Every last one of them has some sort of ethical implication. The French kissing bot, did you see this? Very interesting piece of technology. I do a lot of radio commentary, and when this came out, that's what everybody wanted to know about. Basically, it looks like a toaster with a straw sticking out of it. And you sort of wrap your mouth around one, and someone with whom you're having a deep and lasting relationship wraps their lips around that one. You get on the internet no matter where you are, and you have the sensation of kissing. And when I was talking to the guy from CBS, he said he was online. He says, that looks sort of hokey. And I said, maybe it does, but imagine version 4.0. <laughs> and so the reality is that we have all these technologies, and where do we talk about them? Where do we talk about the ethical implications of all these technologies that <clears throat> become what McLuhan called ground? I had McLuhan as a teacher, and all of the media scape that is invisible to us just sits there and sort of massages us. Let me play you 40 seconds of something that'll sort of put this in perspective. And this is old news. This goes back more than a year ago. We're here today to announce uh, the first uh, synthetic cell, a cell made by uh, starting with the digital code in the computer, uh, building the chromosome uh, from four bottles of chemicals, uh, assembling that chromosome in yeast, transplanting it uh, into a recipient bacterial cell and transforming that cell into a new bacterial species. So uh, this is the first self-replicating species that we've had on the planet whose parent is a computer. Uh, it also is the first uh, species to have its own website encoded in its genetic code. No big deal, just making people. Where do we talk about that? Where do we talk about all the ethical implications of all this technology that is immensely powerful and yet somehow invisible at the same time? Do we do it at school? By and large, no, we don't. 
Do kids go home and say, hey, did you hear about that new thing that they made that can make people? We should talk about the ethical implications of that. What do you think, Bob? I don't know. Maybe, maybe some do, but by and large, probably not. Okay, we're at family dinner. Are we talking about it there? Probably not. So we are swimming in life-changing technology that has unbelievable ethical implications and nobody's really talking about it. And I'm going to suggest that school is a great place to talk about it. And I want to support what the last speaker said in terms of involving students, especially in the development of those kinds of rules and perspectives you would want at your school. What I did in my book, Digital Community, Digital Citizen, is I said, imagine an ideal school board woke up one day and said, hey, we don't understand any of this cyber stuff. We've got cyberbullying, we've got sexting, we've got all these things. We, we didn't grow up with this. How would we retune ourselves to create a school district that would actually be responsive to the age in which we're living and do the best job for our kids in terms of helping them understand it, particularly the ethical implications of all this stuff. I know I'm dreaming, but I had to put sort of out there a metaphor that we could hang our hat on. And then I take you through the process that an ideal school board might go through in order to achieve that. Imagine this as a mission statement. Students will study the personal, social, and environmental impacts of every technology and media application they use in school. Looks, looks harmless enough. Good luck finding a school that uses that, or anything close to it. So much of the emphasis on technology, even though it's got all these ethical implications, is let's use it effectively, let's use it creatively. What we need to add to that is using it wisely. Because in the end, we don't just want better workers. We want better people. We want better citizens, more informed voters. We want all of those things, too. So towards the end of that chapter, where the chapter leads you, the story leads you, is that we need character education for cyberspace. And we don't have it. We need to involve kids, desperately involve kids, to sit down at the table with adults, because the kids really understand the environment. I'd like to think I've learned a thing or two that they don't know at this, at this point, when they're 12, 13, and 14, and say, what would be the character values that you think we ought to observe when you use technology at school, when you're out in cyberspace, what would those look like? And what you realize fairly quickly is that a lot of what we need is already in place, but it does need to be tweaked. There are things that come to the surface, like the importance of empathy in a very abstract world. So it's not just me confronting you right there in front of me, it's me confronting somebody who I don't know, who's half a world away, that I'm saying mean things to or not, and how do we deal, how do you sort of ratchet up empathy to deal with that? We have those issues to deal with, but that's where we need to head, and I don't need to tell you guys, character education was, was expected from about Plato to Eisenhower, and then things sort of dribbled away, and now it's come back in the form of acceptable use agreements. So you, you actually have kids signing pieces of paper saying, I promise I'll be good in cyberspace. And you think, gosh, if we're going to do this, let's do it well. Let's do it really well. And the last point I want to make is I think we're at the point where we need to empower teachers to be ethical coaches. And boy, what a minefield that is. I remember growing up, I was a really geeky kind of kid. I used to go to school board meetings while my friends were going to parties just because I found it fascinating. <clears throat> yeah, I know, I know, I, I'm over that. <laughs> and when I was a teenager, you know what the big issue was? Sex education. And there were two teams, as it were, on the field, both planting their flag in the moral high ground, the parents saying, you won't go near that topic with my kids. And there were the health officials saying, you haven't a clue as to what the facts are. And boy, they went at it and went at it and went at it. And about 40 years later now, it's just sort of expected that, of course, you're going to get some kind of sex education at, at school. And you know why? Because our concern for the safety of our kids trumped everything else. And I'm here to tell you that we will turn around at some point in history, not too far out there, and say, I can't believe we waited this long to have character education for our kids in cyberspace.
And that's the big picture. And I turn it over to you. Well, thank you, thank you, thank you. I have 20 minutes to give you now, so how do you do all of that? And I have to tell you that I've just landed from New York, was given a pay, given, a, this is research of 600, uh, it was a review of 600 studies of bully prevention programs. And the most dismal thing is they have clearly discovered in a meta-analysis only one quarter of them work. Well, we're now gonna look at what does work, and I'm gonna be Fairly blunt to say, at the base of any good program, at any of this that we're looking at, is good, solid character. There's three things, though. It's the ABCs, and we're going to figure out how. Number one is we've got to change kids' attitudes, staff, and the world. That aggression is not the way to get your answer. Number two, behavior. Behavior habits we know at age eight become entrenched. Let's do this a lot faster, folks. And number three, it's character. It's a respectful learning environment. And we know that that's really what's going to make a difference. So let's start looking at, this is your checklist from what we know that research says does work that can turn this thing around. And here's some points. First, we know from Dan Olve, we know from Norway, we know very clearly that attitude of our staff is absolutely essential, and this is the respectful learning environment. When we look at the fastest way to turn bullying around, it's a warm, positive environment. It's firm limits that we know are going to be unacceptable to behavior that are followed through. It's consistent, non-hostile, zero tolerance, does not work. Most research says it actually can increase victimization and increase bullying. Strong adults who are firm uh, models, and now your first question is, how are you doing there? Because don't start with the kids unless you've got here with the staff. The second thing, every bit of research says everybody's got to be on board together. Firm, firm policy that is top down but all around. But the key that we also know is that parents seem to be in a baseline for every effective program. You've got to involve them and they've got to be taught. You all raised your hand that said that you did evidence-based data gathering. Make sure you do, because every research also says that it's absolutely critical. Don't assume that you know what your kids are saying. Anonymous surveys are essential, and from that, you're going to be able to get really the data that you need. Anne was right on the mark, and this is what we need to do. A lot of the stuff on those surveys isn't coming out, so give kids a voice. Focus groups of students is absolutely essential. Every time I do that in a school, I get more information from the kids and the staff is at a state of shock. Where'd you get it? They tell people that fly in, that just sit down and say, here's what we're really concerned about. University of California Davis also gives you a phenomenal clue. New research is saying, don't overlook the second tier kid on the social jungle thing, on the social networking. The second tier child is the one most vulnerable and most likely to be doing the bullying, not the popular. A lot of the stuff that we thought in terms of those social maladaptment of the kids is going out the window. We've got to start looking at the research of what matters and make sure we're looking at those kids. The other thing that all of research is saying is keep in mind that bullying by nature is a relationship problem. We've got to start studying social dynamics and we've got to be very key into our school of who's pulling the power and who's not because a bully is winning with the power. So with those in mind, those are the bottom line. The only other thing that I'm going to tell you is absolutely key. There's one of the fastest ways to turn your bullying around is identify what's called your hot times and your hot spots. If you do what Ann said and talk to those kids, they'll be able to say, here's the places I don't feel the safest. Here's the places where it's happening the most. It's almost always predictable. The key spots on a school are your bathrooms, your hallways, your lockers, your stairwells, your cafeterias where exclusion in middle school and high school is huge, and your playgrounds. If you get adult supervision in those areas, one middle school principal made a full cutout of herself, this big cardboard cutout, put it in the middle of the hall, and said, I'm watching you. You never know when I'm going to show up. Guess what happened? Bullying went down. If kids know they're being monitored, it will be reduced. Use your smartness. Some of the stuff we're overlooking. Here's the six R's. We just went through. Those are the cores that you have to have. Here's the six R's to make the change. And what research is also saying is one program isn't going to do it. It has to be a multidimensional approach with a lot of factors that we're going to say do work from meta-analysis, 
but you also have to make sure that everybody's on board together. Once you have those little preliminaries, here's the six R's that are absolutely essential. You're going to set clear rules that we know. Character matters, and in this school, we are nice, and we are going to be empathic, but we're also going to teach how. Number two, everybody on board in your school has got to be able to figure out how to recognize bullying. One of the biggest mistakes is you define it one way, you define it another way. Let's be clear, and I'll show you how. Third is, kids need to be able to safely know how to report what they are telling us as they grow up from fifth grade on. They no longer are coming to tell us, the staff, why? Because we didn't listen, they say. Oh, how sad is that? So we got to give them another, other options because we've got to keep a pulse to make sure our kids are feel cared about, feel belong, and for heaven's sakes, feel safe. Four, everybody needs to know how to respond when you see it or when you hear it. We know we got to teach staff how to respond with empathic responses, but in particular, what we got to do is teach bystanders, the kids, 85% of them who are watching it and viewing it, what to do. There's the missing link. Four is we got to help victims learn how to refuse and refuse earlier, otherwise victimization continues. We are looking at, I just did a documentary on bully sides, on we followed a number of children who were suicidal or their parents or the child had killed themselves, and I'm telling you, I'm still shaken. This is not a phase, and it continues through life. We're now looking at MRIs and watching victims' brain patterns, and it is a scary trend, folks. And sixth is, Let's have some empathy for some of these bullies. Unless we turn them around by age 26, if they're doing this at age eight, they got a one in four chance to have a criminal record. So there's your six R's. Let's look at what a school does to turn them around. And you start with setting clear rules together as a group. That means we're going to sit down together and we're going to figure out what we stand for. The KIPPS program has the easiest rule known to man. You work hard and you be nice. And that's it. And we're going to validate that. But we understand that if everybody's on board with the same rules, at least that's clear, and any respectful environment has those. It means there's Kelowna and then Okanagan. It's we're the Blue Ribbon School, or we're the Blue Balloon School. She makes it into an acronym. It's the principal announcing at an assembly. By the way, assemblies have very low correlation to turning a bully pr program around. But they do help set a tone of here's what's expected. Assemblies need to be ongoing so kids understand what's expected, why it's important, but you keep reviewing the rules. In this room, in this school, we build each other up, we don't deflate each other. That's the acronym they use. Three rules seem to be critical that Olve's method from Norway says are the rules in your classroom. Classroom management and clear discipline that's ongoing in a respectful learning environment, hands-on in that meta-analysis keep coming up clearly as one of the highest correlations to reduce bullying. Three rules that Olve says are important. You listen and you respect everybody's ideas. You think about the feelings of others and we say only nice things. What you're actually doing there is character. It's empathy, conscience, and self-control. Class meetings, hands down, yes. And I see that you've got them going on in one of your programs. Go view how to do them if you're not doing them. The democratic environment seems to clearly reduce bullying. Autocratic environment in a classroom increases it. The tone matters. Videos, by the way, that came up as a as one of the things that does help, alone doesn't, but videos of splices so kids can talk about it and understand why it's important seem to be essential. The absolute hands down is ongoing parent education, ongoing, not that it's October, so let's do an hour presentation. But we've got to educate parents. They need to know what the signs are of bullying, of, of their own child being a bully. They also need to know how to turn it around, and they want ongoing communication. Meta-analysis says this is one of the most effective ways that we may be missing, is get those parents involved early. Second thing is we've got to teach kids how to recognize it, and staff recognizes it. One of the things that we're seeing is too many people are misinterpreting bullying. So what is it? The hands down seems to be that there's always a negative intent it's usually repeated and there's an imbalance. It's not aggression of two kids. It's one kid who cannot hold their own. Once you know the definition, then you're going to make sure everybody understands it. And you make sure that each grade level, you understand the different kinds of bullying so you're aware of those signs. It's hard 
It's, or certainly in terms of the electronic bullying. But you better be very clear that that's where a majority of our kids right now are doing their cruelest acts, and it is impacting our climate, our culture, and our kids' character. Comprehensive ongoing staff training, meta-analysis says, is essential as well. But it has to be a staff who understands what it is, what we're about, and changing the belief structures of the staff so they understand it. Then, one of the things that I love, this is the Northern Light School Division up at Alberta. What they decided to do is to make sure that everybody was on board together. They sent a shared PowerPoint to every single classroom so the teacher could make sure that we're talking together about it, but everybody was on board with the same definition. And then the kids are involved in the program. This is what it looks like. Here's what it sounds like. But these are clear, huge boards that are everywhere on a school so everybody understands this is what we're talking about. And then you can respond well. This is the big kids helping the little kids or the seniors helping the, the ninth graders when they come in. This is what we stand for. Here's what we're not going to tolerate. Second thing is, so how do you report it? Once you know it, then what do you do and how do you report it? That would be number three. And the point on this one is research clearly says, first, we've got to mobilize our kids. We've got to mobilize them so that we know that there's a difference between tattling and there's a difference between reporting. We know this. I spent a lot of time working in school shootings, and we realized that this was core to school safety. You mobilize the kids, but second of all, there's a couple of things that our children are telling us when we do um, what Anne is saying, start talking to those kids. They say, some teachers help you, some teachers don't. That's sad. I don't know who to report to and who not to. So you designate to your kids, here's some people you can go to and make sure there's one in each hall and each department. That's the first thing, because those teachers are going to know how to report it and how to respond because they're trained. But the second thing is you must give confidential options, a report box that has a lock on it. Maybe there's a click or an email, but we're finding that one technique alone does not work, and too many of our kids are not reporting because they don't feel safe or know how. Fourth is, how do you respond? Your staff needs to be clear in knowing what to do and how to respond when they see it, and they must be consistent with it, or bullies get away with it. You've got to send a clear message. But the other thing we've got to do, this is, the, this is from BC. They set up a wonderful response technique with a binder that was wonderful when we looked at violence and aggression on actual steps. But everybody's trained in it, so they know what to do. 85% of your kids from Pepler's work on University of Toronto, fabulous stuff, are witnessing this stuff, and it is removing their empathy as well. But if we know how to mobilize those kids to know what to do when they see it, because peer cruelty is escalating. Aggression is contagious, but so too is the next peer called kindness. So let's turn that around. What we're seeing is a couple of things. Kids need to know, is it bullying and is, in some, is somebody in harm's way? If somebody can get hurt, don't stand there. Immediately go get help, and kids are trained in it. This is at Cornelia Elementary in Edina. If not, then you can bust it, and you're actually taught skills. I, I did this on a Dateline special when we spent an hour training kids, and there were certain kids, by the way, the kids with the empathy were the ones who really knew how to do this stuff well. But what we're finding is that some kids don't have the bystander skills to be able to figure out what to do. These are called bully buster skills. Six, five is, how do you teach the kid who is the victim to refuse? We've got to identify those kids. It's not just the marginalized child. Maybe you need to do some sociograms as well because we're overlooking some children. Figure out what those bullying signs are. Get them through to the parents because many of our kids aren't telling and they're hurting as a result of it. Identify those signs. Watch out for your kids. We know that from Tepler studies of just in the University of Toronto, we can video camera record thousands of hours on a playground. And within split seconds, we can identify with a video in 10 seconds who's most likely to be a victim. One of the things we're doing as counselors is helping our kids learn strong body language because strong body language is a diffuser for it. Another thing, teaching them how to be calm. Stay calm because if you look upset, the bully wins. 
Teach them how to assert. What are some comebacks? Teach the kid to look the kid in the eye and make your voice sound firm like you mean it. This actually helps you not only when you're five, it helps you in domestic abuse at age 45. Teaching kids earlier is what we need to do. What they're doing at Clover Bar, this is up in Alberta, is the junior high kids said some kids don't feel safe to say, so they made cards. If you've got a card, you can turn it into a staff member and they'll help you. It's kids who are saying this is what we need to feel safer. It's special ed. Watch out, they're really marginalized. But it's teaching them specific skills. It's the parent. It's the home. It's the counselor working together to defuse it. And finally, you got to teach replacer skills so that thing like the bully knows a different way of acting. At this point, he is figuring aggression works, and it has. So what we're going to do instead, we're looking at, this is Arnold Goldstein's model, it's up at Nor in New York, phenomenal stuff, but it's actually boost, built on empathy, conscience, and self-control. These are adolescent uh, offenders, and we're turning them around in aggression by replacing aggression through character. We're looking at MRI studies that we know bullies actually respond differently. We look at their heart rates going up a little bit, and we look at a breakdown in empathy development. Roots of Empathy is phenomenal as a program. Mary Gordon's program, again through Canada, it's now in Hong Kong, teaching emotional identification through a baby, and we're seeing amazing responses to the bully as well. Tomorrow we're going to look much more specifically on how to boost empathy. I'm going through quickly here. But the other thing that we're finding, and a meta-analysis that I want to just, just be very clear upon is that restitution is critical and we're also looking at zero tolerance not working for a bully. Find meaningful ways to allow a child who has done cruelty to another child to actually turn that kid's life around. This one is BC. It's a program that was done. This is the, the you're looking at the kid who is at this point, the offender, who doesn't look like he's bonded too well, but the poor Noah, who's sitting on the floor. But it was a teacher and a principal who said, we've tried everything and it's not working. The teacher said, I'm not giving up on that kid, the bully. Instead, what I'm going to make him do is service learning projects, and he's going to befriend this child, and you want to feel sorry for the five-year-old. But they did learning. They kept it going. They made the child, who's the big bully, keep track of what he was doing and how to bond with the child actually was rebuilding empathy. About 21 days later, with a photo journal watching this child's relationship, you saw something open up. You saw a change in a child who was a bully because he realized aggression doesn't work, empathy does. But the best part of this whole darn thing was Noah, who pulled us aside and said, I knew he could do it. Some kids, it takes a little while. You just had to give them a little bit of hope, and that's what it's all about. So what you just saw were six R's in the fastest thing known possible, but this is what meta-analysis says. We'll turn it around. It means we got a lot more work to do, folks. It means that when you look at a bully prevention program, the first thing you better do is check, does it work? Is it valid? Next thing is, is the climate working at your school? Are there rules? Does everybody know how to recognize it? Do you know how to report it? Do you know how to respond? Do you know how to teach a child how to refuse? And you know how to replace those behaviors? What you now have is character. It's empathy, conscience, and self-control, and that's why we're here for the next three days, rebuilding this, and I think we've got a future of hope for a lot of kids. So. That's it in a nutshell. I'm turning this over to you, and the three of us would take any questions you have. We've got microphones ready for you. Come on up and ask, and thank you. We love the Creek Blitz, but we need to unpack it. So could you help us, give us the PowerPoint, could you give us audio so we can go back to our schools and unpack it together? Yes, but what I will do is put this not in a PowerPoint, I'll put it in the, the actual points because the PowerPoint is too, it doesn't give you the points behind. Whatever. Let me, let me sit down, whatever. <laughs> whatever. So let, me sit, let me sit down and figure out how I can type it up for you and I'm turning it over to, uh, do you have Anne? <laughs> Do you have, Jason, um, any PowerPoint presentations or Absolutely. information? Sure. We'll share yes. All right. Yeah. Thank and you. And what I'll do is give it to CEP, who can put it on their website. How about that?
plenary sessions and more, and we're kind of going, we're following Jason's advice, so we're going to try and get this uh, live and uh, posted on our website for you all to take advantage of. So that's work in progress for us. There you we'll, go. We'll so go now you have the PowerPoint. Now we just need to do is then here's the checklist of making sure you have what you have. Other Good questions? morning. I can't see. Can you turn the lights on a little bit? Are the house lights? Thank you. Go ahead. Go ahead. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Val from Pinellas County, Florida. Our district has uh, an Olvaeus bullying prevention yes. program. We have an online reporting system for anybody, parents, kids, yes. teachers. Uh, we have uh, the Jeffrey Johnson Act. Um, Anyway, we have a very vibrant character education program. We have ethics at the high school. We have ethical leadership training. We have a high school ethics bowl for students to debate ethical issues. We have a lot going on. The adults, yeah. uh, the people in our schools, and, and I'm saying we have tremendously wonderful teachers um, we still have schools that we know bullying's happening at the schools that they're saying, no, it's not happening. It's, uh, there are no reports from the schools. Some of the schools even have incidences that are in the news of students that have done something egregious. And, and, uh, and still the school is saying, no, we're, we're, we don't have bullying, uh, we're not reporting. Well, first of all, yeah, you're, I, yeah, you're not alone. Unfortunately, what we're seeing is the biggest concern we have is, is uh, adults not having, getting the buy-in. And what we know, and so as a result of it, they don't take it seriously, they think it's a phase, or they, because, let's also be clear, many bullies can be very manipulative, cunning, and do their backs work when your back is turned. They don't see it in action. Uh, the relational bullying or uh, the electronic bullying is a harder seed to sell. So that's why I think, and then I'm going to turn this over to you too, I think that evidence base is absolutely critical. Once a year doesn't seem to do it. In fact, the new thing is, is at least three times a year with different report techniques. I think the and technique of being able to get kids and then type up here's what they're saying is the first step to turn it around. And then it's leadership top down that says it is happening. We are now responsible with our own integrity to do something about it. I would just add the, the surveys that um, are out there, it's just say you've got to do the survey because students will tell us the truth. Yes, the students even say, yes, we'll do this, but the adults. You know, yeah, I th the, the fastest way to this doesn't have to cost a whole mm -hmm. bunch of money. The fastest thing that I could tell everybody to do on Monday is give every kid in your whole school a three by five card using a pencil and don't put your pen, don't put your name. Where's the space where, how on a scale of one to 10, how safe do you feel at this school? Where are the hotspot times and the hotspot times and times and spots? You collect that, what you'll have is instant evidence that don't cost a dime, it takes about a minute and you will say, you know, a third of the kids don't feel safe, and here's the spots they don't feel safe, and there's where you begin, then start adult visibility in those particular zones. Thank you. Um, one, one more thing, I'm sorry. It, moral courage. Do we need to take this to the next level and start teaching what is moral courage? Yes, you do, but the problem is moral courage is made up of uh, a number of different variables, and what we now know is moral courage, you can't get it unless you first have the piece called empathy, then you need assertiveness and the conscience, so it's made up of a number of virtues. I know that because I just got back from Rwanda, and let me tell you something, after studying genocide, I have learned something about moral courage. There's habits involved in it, but boy, that's the end product of where you want to go to. All right, thank you. Hi, I'm Sherry from Claremont, Florida. Um, we are lacking some consistency um, within our classes on just the overall behave plan. And so we're restructuring this year. And what I'm wondering is, is there a kind of a level one, tier one for RTI behavior plan that you are finding to be successful uh, in terms of research, since we're gonna kind of restructure? Uh, I'm going to just reaffirm what you just said. The first thing is from looking at 600 reviews of 600 studies, one of the five most important things to reduce bullying that's coming up clearly is 
classroom management discipline that is um, consistent. And I think one of the, th with each teacher doing that, that one, if without that, it just backfires. So one of the things we're also seeing, um, in fairness to all of us as a group of a teacher, is that we need to do a lot more teacher training on classroom management of what are skills that we need to do. I mean, that's, I think it's ongoing, um, I, I don't see the answer to that one, but the emotional social learning pieces have some wonderful research on it. The key, though, that is the footnote that says is ongoing staff training so everybody's on board with the same techniques, and many of the teachers coming out of our school systems are saying they're not trained in that nearly enough, so it's backfiring. So you wouldn't necessarily say, oh, look at champs, or look at this, or look at that. It's just, the, just pick... There are and behavior principles that everybody needs to know okay. that I think that's what seems to be the missing link. But programs seem to be much more helpful to teachers to be able to start them with, here's what seems to, we can use those principles and we believe in those principles. And do you have any recommendation of programs in addition to the uh, behavior? No, except the, the program, that was the one, somebody say this from Canada, that's the, that's the program on um, behavior intervention uh, somebody say it. Come on, Canadians, where are you? It's a behavior intervention approach, and I think it's, it's um, yeah, say it louder. There you go. Raise your hand, because you two are going to connect. Who said that? Come on, be assertive. There you go. She's right there. She can't wait to talk to you. <laughs> I'm with the, my name is Becky Cohen Vargas, I'm with the Not In Our School Project, and we actually make videos and work on turning bystanders into upstanders, students taking the lead on issues of bullying and hate. And I have a question, recently on, um, Anderson Cooper had a lot of things on CNN this week, and one of the things was about a lawsuit taking place in Minnesota where there was a school district where the students are protesting a neutrality act about not being able to talk about LGBTQ gay and lesbian issues in the school district. And they compared that district with another one in Minnesota that's taking, in Minneapolis, that's taking a stand on making schools safe for gay and lesbian students. And with the issue of gay and lesbian students being some of the biggest victims of ongoing repeated daily bullying, and we've seen that and we have videos also in relation to ways to stand up to that. I just wondered if you had examples of districts that were making a difference. Because it occurs to me that we're not going to do it only by saying, it's kind of like zero tolerance, okay? No, you can't say these words, you can't do these things. But as long as the attitude persists, the bullying is going to persist. Yeah, I, I can't give you uh, song and verse about which districts, but I can say that it's really important in the self-identification surveys that you get that data confidentially, anonymously, because um, often the surveys won't go there. And then you don't know what's happening with different groups of students. And it's also racial groups. Um, so I just cannot say more strongly, make sure you make it a safe place for children, for students to self-identify. So then the students can Yes. I think we have a long way to go on this particular yes. one to Absolutely. really make yes. a difference. I think this year with all the suicides of kids that were, came to the front, forefront, we just really need to step back. And, and so by the way, um, I wish that, uh, Jason, you were right, that sex education was an issue in the 50s, 60s, yes. and 70s. It's back, folks. It's huge mm -hmm. back. It's back, big time. Thank you. Hi, good morning. I, I think a lot of the six R's are right on. Everybody. And agree with that pretty much. Way in the back. Where are you? Oh. Um, oh. But I want. Can you hear? Okay. Yes, I saw and My you. name is Jim Cantoni. I'm with a little company in, in Connecticut called Givegetta, and oh. um, I just wanted to ask: anti-bullying and bullying um, are some terms, and in some states are changing that to mean-spirited behavior. My limited understanding is you get what you focus on, and if you focus on bullying, you get more bullying. If you focus on mean-spirited behavior, you're yeah. kind of encouraging that. If you tell someone that was mean. What's your thought on, say, geez, I know you're kinder than that. Is everything OK if someone's an act of bullying? Uh, one of the, th my, my thought is that the research is saying the big question we need to be doing as, as teachers and staff is the detective question as to why. Because each bully is bullying for a different reason. 
The key is what's, what's lying beneath it. And once we figure that out, we can figure it out. So for some kids, that's a great question. Okay, and then as a follow-up, how important is, is teaching um, uh, kindness, forgiveness on, on both ends of the spectrum? What do you define both ends of the spectrum? Uh, whether the, the bully or the bully or the child or whoever's being bullied. Um, absolutely essential because what we because the research is saying one of the missing looks of this whole character is that aggression is contagious, but so too is kindness. So if we make kindness not a noun, let's all define what it is, but instead make it much more of a verb, start really making kids be those bystanders that start doing that, doing kind deeds, what we actually find is a spillover effect, and it, we know this for years, it actually increases our climate. I mean, we've seen that with character education throughout the nation. Uh, when you create a climate of caring, you get students who are engaged in the right behaviors. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to have to stay on schedule, but uh, uh, let me just add one thing from a CEP perspective that uh, in the audience is uh, Dr. Jonathan Cohn, who runs the School Climate Center, uh, uh, and he's a partner of ours and just completed a scan on school climate at the state level <clears throat> that talks about the different policies and what's available at the state level for school climate, married that up and juxtaposed it with data for bullying prevention legislation in each of the 50 states, and we at CEP have done an analysis on character education state level legislation in each of the 50 states. So we're going to try and provide you all information that you need for state level. I'd like to take the opportunity to thank our distinguished panelists. They're very, very busy people. Uh, Jason, <laughs> Jason for, for example, was in Canada yesterday, California today, and Connecticut tomorrow. Um, Michelle, I had to call her to get some advice for something a few weeks ago, and I think she was doing Dr. Phil, Dr. Drew, MSNBC special on the crisis in education in America, and oh, by the way, the Today Show, and I think got on the plane for Rwanda like two days later. So very busy people, but they carved out time to come here to share their insight and their wisdom and their advice and counsel for all of you. Thank you all very much.